but yeah, I don't think it's Saint Pete. I think it's like a crop near Mecca. So yep. So I've been Cigar City, sure. baby. Cigar City. We also have um, not Green Bend. But green Bend so well. My friends freaking a lot called Willard's. It just said there's forty tops. Yeah. Is it time for the next door? Not quite. It's like an awful quiet. Okay, let's uh, start. City Paradise. You have seen my email this morning uh, regarding the special office hour and uh, I have uh, posted the practice exam for the first time um, when I, I knew it's not to this, but I am changing my method. So you have uh, the practice exam 1.1 to 1.2 posted there. And that's the exam that I gave um, last semester. Okay, so that you can be familiarized and prepare ahead. And we'll, we'll go through um, these um, as we proceed so that it's not just accumulating at the end. Um, let's see what I'm now. And uh, Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's one thing that you may want to keep in mind. It's up here. You also have uh, a copy of the portal here that may say one click, but uh, the portal is independent. You may want to bookmark it. Yeah. Okay. And I also listed here. Uh, the list of the hard copy lecture notes that I distributed out. So in case someone needs to print out something, you can go there. And uh, for those of you who have not uh, filled in the survey, please do so. Uh, last time I checked, we had 40 students. Uh, so some 11 students have not filled out. I don't know what's the status right now, but uh, the majority, more than half, prefer the hard copy. Uh, and the rest uh, is divided into three categories. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, let's see here. Oh yeah, so when I'm uh, on this, um, this uh, page here, I'd like to show you this note that I added. <coughs> Recently, I have not completed the summary, but this is what I discovered after my last um, lecture. Uh, the difference in the behavior of Chrome and Firefox in terms of searching, right? Because that's very important for you to search for keywords. For example, this is Chrome, and if you click into the document and say Control F, you see that there's a search box on the um, you know, upper right corner. Okay, so say for example, you can search for, uh, say, dynamics. Then you see that, uh, you know, the, the, the search can find it here. And if you click on the slider and say Control F, then there's another search box popping up, and you can you can still use this one. Say, say for example, Akashi. Uh, you know, Kaikyo Bridge, then you can find all of that. But Firefox was uh, different when I tried last time, and I didn't understand why until I discover the behavior, its behavior later. So let me put the same document in under Firefox, because many of you may use Firefox, some others use Chrome. So here again, if you click, in on the document, right? So I click on the document and say Control F. Then I, I have a similar search box in the upper right corner of the Google Doc. Okay. But if I click on the slider, and yeah, and here I can search also. So let's say for example Akashi, then it can find the word. But if I click on the slider, the vertical slider on the uh, right, and then say Control F, you see that the box, the search box, appears in the lower left corner. And let's try to see whether I can search with this lower left corner or not. So I type Akashi. 
uh, you know, it, it did not uh, um, you know, it actually highlight the word in the search box of Google. Okay, so uh, you, you need to be careful if you want to use Firefox and you want to click in you know, on the document before you type control S so that the search box of Google doc would pop up. Okay, so that's something you want to keep in mind because, like I said, um, uh, you know, if you go to the list of topics and search for topics, uh, this is useful to know. Okay, the, the different behavior. I'm not. I don't have, uh, uh, I'm not a Mac user, so I don't know how Safari would behave, but if you see something strange, uh, you can immediately suspect that uh, there could be different behavior of the, uh, of the search, uh, of the browser. Okay. So now I'd like to, uh, so let's uh, quickly uh, review what we did last time. So this is the simple case of uh, Spring, Dapper, and Mask uh, in series, okay? And, um, and this is the starting for the more complex case of one end fixed and the other end free. And that I, I have gone through that already. Uh, this is meeting eight, and I didn't have the time to do the annotation yet. And this is meeting six, okay, regarding the dollar bear force. Okay, so for today, I'd like to um, bring up section 53C, which you should have a hard copy, right? <coughs> and we now look at a very specific numerical example for for this uh, <coughs> system, this model, two degrees, two degrees of freedom system, okay, with specific numerical example. Uh, now, in the uh, report problem, the difference between the example here and in the report problem probably is best illustrated uh, through the numerical values of the spring constant. Right, so the spring constants are K1, K2, K3, and here you have K1 equal to 14 minus square, square root of six, K2 square root of six, and K3, three minus square root of six. Okay, so these, these are not equal to each other, whereas in the uh, report problem, it's simpler. You have three spring constants equal to each other. Essentially, I purposefully uh, use an almost the average of these three uh, numerical values. Okay. So that's one thing you keep want to keep in mind. Um, the uh, next aspect is I'd like to um, re review or refresh your mind of um, the connection between, yeah, this is uh, Firefox, or oh, let me close this, if I don't bring it up. Between the uh, <coughs> Akashi Gaikyo bridge and what we are doing, remember I, I plotted the, um, the bridge as a continuous um, bar, let me put this. You remember what meeting that was? Probably let me try meeting ah right on the top, meeting three. Now so the Akashi Kaikyo bridge is con considered as a continuous bar. Right? <coughs> and you discretize into finite element as shown here. And you can if, if you consider only the axial deformation, right? No transversal deformation, just the axial deformation, then you can obtain an equivalent spring. You know, so each element would behave like a spring. Uh, <coughs> and the expression for the equivalent spring would be a function of the Young's modulus, the area of the cross-section, and the length. And the formula was given here. 
like k equal to e a over l. Uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, use this opportunity to really, I, I would like to and anxiously train you to practice doing the exam immediately. Okay, so here how it goes. Yeah, are you going to post the solutions to the exam? Oh, I think you should uh, take notes. Yeah, I think the, the best is to take notes and follow, but there would be not the exactly the solution. Yeah, please take notes because, um, you know, as you go through, it's better to understand and then you can write your own notes and have, if you have questions to ask. Okay, so the blue line here would represent the continuous bar. Okay, so what you want to, for, for this type of problem, uh, I don't have the file in my um, flash drive yet. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, so to magnify, I guess I just do control plus. Get up like, uh, uh, this is the, the maximum that I can go. Uh, if I have the file separately on my flash drive, I can download it, but it will take some time. Uh, so think of this is exactly the same system that we have been working since the beginning, right? And these blue, thick blue lines are the uh, the continuous bar that you just saw, you know, for example, the model of the Akashi Kaiko bridge. Okay, so you have uh, spring and continuous bar. But you know that a continuous bar is equivalent to a spring. So the first thing that you do immediately is to think that uh, this okay <laughs> let me quickly draw here So we have three elements. Okay, and I have the mass in uh, between. Right. Okay, so that's that's our system and the difference between these and the exam problem is that you have uh, essentially two additional, I mean three additional springs but you can reduce it to equivalent spring. Okay, so let's, um, <coughs> let's start to think like this. Uh, you can have um, rigidly, so that this represents a rigid connector okay and then you have uh, two springs in series this is the first one and this is the second one uh, <coughs> and then you have uh, and let's say the two ends are fixed okay and then you have a third spring let me go back to the uh, statement here. That would connect the right support to point B. Okay, so it span all the way from the right support here to point B, which is here. So that would be represented by something like this. So, like they might ask uh, whether there's a solution possible, so in a, in a way this is the solution. Okay. Uh, but you want to, to write uh, detailed notes uh, um, in addition to my notes, uh, that's up to you. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to, I mean, have, um, oh, 
Okay, so that's essentially the equivalent in springs, and let me, uh, I think I call K1, K2, K3, so let's write down the uh, K1 here, K2 here, K3 here, and then there's some additional uh, <coughs> Elements Okay, so um, I cannot zoom in further, but let me walk you through as follows and, and, you know, Next time I download the file so I can zoom in So this is element 1, this is element 2, element 3 That's the spring and, and damper in parallel and if you read, you know, if you open your tablet and open this file, you would see that <coughs> I say element four is uh, is the bar in series. You know, the pair of elastic bars uh, in series between node B and node C. That's that's these two. Okay. That's called element four. And then uh, element five would be this elastic bar. Here. <coughs> so um, let me um, give it, you know, because they, this, the two springs in parallel can also be equivalent to a single spring, okay, and that would be K4. So here I would like to use a different symbol, uh, let's say K, um, you know, the notation, if you look at this notation here, that's uh, E1, A1, L1, and E2, A2, L2, uh, E3, A3, L3, that's the Young's modulus, the area of the cross-section and the length, okay. Um, <coughs> so let's, I need to invent a, a different notation here. Um, uh, you know, say temporarily. Let's 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 use something that is different from from K. Uh, let me call this you know B or uh, or S for spring. Yeah, S one and S two, and this would be S three. Okay. Now it's uh, S three would be equal to the same as K five. That's the fifth spring constant. That's the easy part because K five, um, K five would be equal to S three equal to uh, E three A three over L three. If we follow the uh, formula given here, right? This this is the uh, spring constant of element E equal to the Young's modulus of element E times the area of the cross section of element E divided by the length, right? So um, <coughs> so that's that's how you would obtain this uh, result. And where is for uh, S1 and S2? Uh, let me, so that's K4, okay? Um, so the question is how to express K4 in terms of uh, S1 and S2. So what would be what would be the method? Can you just add them together? Add them together. Uh, so one 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 answer would be K four would be equal to S one plus S two. Okay, this is this is a, a question mark. Is there any other suggestion? So uh, please let me note down. Um, K4 
Kevin's contribution. And what, while I'm doing this, you can think or discuss with your teammates. Yes, he's um, and Kevin, what team number? Team Kevin? seven. Team seven. Two So please check uh, the uh, lecture summary for your contribution later. But let's think about this. You know, let's analyze. And this is very important here. Uh, if you have uh, two springs in parallel, okay, and uh, the spring constant is S1 and S2, then you would have, uh, you would let's say, the forces. This is what you can add. And, and for now, let's say, yeah. just like statics, if you like, you know. And if you perform an Euler cut, let's say this is F. Uh, let me use the rank. Okay, F. <coughs> uh, and if you perform the Euler cut like this. Right, and of course you can also isolate. You know, you can also cut on this side as well this way, and then in the middle you have the the uh, the uh, spring element. Then uh, you would have the spring S one. With the spring force, let's let's call it F one and over here F1, okay? And uh, similarly, for the spring S2, and then just uh, replace the uh, subscript by number two, So if you look at the equilibrium of this free body diagram, these, these are the free body diagrams of the spring. So this we, we went through this part already before in a very similar situation. So now the uh, free body diagram of the connector. Right? So you have the, the force F here. But on, on these two cuts, you would have minus F1 and minus F2, or if you draw in the opposite direction, uh, you use the back color here. So this would be F1, and this would be F2. And so sum of forces equal to zero. <coughs> give you uh, minus F1, minus F2, plus F equal to zero, right? So therefore F is equal to F1 plus F2, okay? And the displacement is the same in the case of spring in series. So therefore, uh, so therefore you can write F1 is equal to S1 times D, D being the displacement in the pair, right? And there's only one. Uh, or you can also uh, write like this, maybe yeah. um, you can write that uh, spring in parallel. So you have D1 equal to D2 equal to D, okay? Because the displacement, you know, remember for springs in parallel, the displacement of this Note here is the same as displacement in the spring S1 and the spring S2. Okay, so we call D uh, the common variable. And likewise, for the spring S2, okay, then you have uh, F2 equal to, let me use the red color here so that you can see that. The subscript is different, but the displacement is the same. So when you add F1 to F2, you can pull D out as a common factor. OK? 
Okay, and that's the reason why you can add um, the spring constant. Okay, so F is therefore equal to S1 plus S2 times D. And that's what Kevin was saying that K4, uh, let's, uh, let me use uh, this. The equivalent spring is the sum of uh, of the two spring constant S1 and S2, but this is for the case where the springs are in parallel, whereas the statement of the problem, the springs are in series. So clearly, uh, this is not what you want right, to, to use, but on the other hand, you need to redo the analysis, and <coughs> again, uh, free body diagram, right? So the free body diagram would be, would go like this. So you have the first spring, and then you have the second spring. And now, you see, before you add the forces, so the springs in parallel, the forces are added, but the displacement are equal. Now, when the springs are in, in series, then you remember we did discuss this before, the forces are the same. But the displacement you need to add together. Okay, so <coughs> so then you have the force uh, the same. Okay, <coughs> and uh, here you have um, S one, S two here. Say S one here, right? And let's uh, call the force F. So now F. Here means that F equal to F2, okay? Because this is the, the force inside the spring 2. And on this side, you can think of F equal to F1. But F1 is also equal to F2 because, you know, these two forces in, in the middle here has to be equal, okay? So, so F1 has to be equal to F2. So, so the forces are the same. But how about the displacement? Uh, displacement D1 is equal to the force F1 divided by S1, right? Okay. Whereas the displacement in the spring 2 is equal to the force F2 divided by the spring constant S2. Okay. And now the springs are in series. You need to add the displacement. The displacement are not equal, so therefore the total displacement D is really D1 plus D2. Okay, and so D1 plus D2 is equal to uh, F1 divided by S1 plus F2 divided by S2. But F1 is equal to F2 equal to F. F1 equal to F2 equal to F. So therefore, D can be written as 1 over S1 plus 1 over S2 times F. Okay? And now, you can see that this factor here is the inverse of the, of the spring constant. Okay? You can call this uh, 1 over k okay so that or k4 because this is ele you know element 4 so therefore the spring constant uh, the equivalent spring constant for two springs in series is written as follows uh, 1 over k4 is equal to this one. Okay, so summary. The equivalent spring constant for two springs in series is that one, the inverse of the equivalent spring constant is equal to the sum of the two inverses. Okay. That's that's what you, you get. In other words, how do you find the spring constant? Maybe I let someone contribute to, and get 
active learning credit. So now the question Can is you how, you, back up how do you get the expression for K4? Kevin, let, let some other. No, I mean, can you scroll back up a little bit? Scroll up? Please. Uh, scroll down. Right. Okay. Like this? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, someone in the back? Yes. Uh, uh, Lenda, did you contribute before? You did? Yes. Yeah, so that's someone new. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, divide by some, yes. So, um, what is your team number? What team number? One. Can you speak louder? One. Team one and the name? Let me, let me get my list. Uh, <coughs> yeah, your name? Michael. Michael? Okay, so Michael said, um, <coughs> you know, you, you, this is simply, uh, you can write uh, S1 plus S2 divided by S1 times S2. So therefore, K4 is, um, equal to, <coughs> This, the inverse of this, right? So all I need is just swap the numerator and the denominator. Okay? And that's what my call of team done, let's say. Right. So this is the formula for the equivalent spring for two springs in parallel. Okay? So it's not just the sum of S1 plus S2, but actually S1 times S2 divided by the sum. So that's it. That's very nice. So, so, so you have uh, the solution here for the exam. You can you can get this equivalent spring, and that equivalent spring is uh, K4. So then you can redraw this figure and represent instead of two springs in uh, in parallel. Now the problem becomes you know it's like Caesar said, right? Divide and conquer. You 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 would conquer the problem by you know, dividing it into simpler and simpler problems. So now these two springs can be replaced by a single equivalent swing K4. Okay, so let me draw that. Single equivalent spring and we can now mark K4. And you know how to connect K4 to S1 and S2. So the problem becomes much simpler, right? You have only one spring here, one spring over there, and these three uh, system of parallel spring and then does it, uh, does it go the same for adding two dampers in series? Uh, adding two dampers in series, you mean adding one more damper here? Yeah, like let's say there's two dampers in series on the first one. You mean one more damper here and one more damper no, here? No, like two consecutive ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Two dampers in parallel? No, yeah. in series. In series? Yeah. Um, like you add the same yeah, you can work out the details. Yeah, you can work out the details following, you know, the free body diagram. You know, so what is the underlying principle? Let me zoom out so that you can have a big picture. You know, and this is uh, again and again the difference between uh, objects in parallel. You know, so in parallel, the displacement are the same. The forces is some of the forces. When, when it's in series, the forces are the same. You sum the displacement. So now if you replace the spring by the damper, well, you know, the displacement <coughs> should be replaced by what? Contribution. Uh, Kevin, team six. By velocity. Uh, what, is your, what is your team number and name? Hello? What is your team number and name? <coughs> Jason. And Jason and Kevin, team six. Okay. Very good. Jason, team, or oh, Kevin, team. And Jason. Okay, very good. So so that's, that's the solution. Okay, so far. Uh, yeah.
and then we'll look into more details. Okay, so uh, you know, I I divide the solution of the exam into several chunks in parallel with my teaching. You know, so let's 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 do some let's make some advancement in in this in this lecture note. Okay, which is um, section 53C. So you see that just with this first page, we already made a lot of uh, progress in solving the exam problem. So now go back to the simpler case where we don't have the additional uh, element four and five, the strings in element four and five. And these are the coefficients. Now, so these are the, the spring constants. And then you have the numerical values for the masses, M1 and M2. And then you have the uh, damping coefficients, C1, C2, C3. And you look, right? C1 is 76 minus 11 square root of 6 divided by 10. And it's okay. <laughs> right? And C2, 11 square root of 6 divided by 10. C3, 27 minus 22 square root of 6 divided by 20. It looks complicated, right? But that was purposefully chosen so that when you uh, decouple the system into two independent uh, scalar second order equation, the coefficient would be real C. Okay, so that, you know, uh, I obtained these numbers by solving the problem backward. I started with two simple uh, scalar equations with simple coefficients and build up to this level. Okay? And that's how you, I obtain these, these coefficients. So don't, don't be scared because of seemingly uh, complicated um, numerical values. Uh, but you will see in the end, it would, these numbers would lead you to very simple uncoupled second order uh, ODEs. Now for the forcing, uh, force matrix. Cap F1 and cap F2, um, you know, I define a function H of T, a function of time T, okay? And the components of the, of the matrix, the column matrix, are small F1 and small F2. And numerically, also by design, it has the following values. One of the square root of five is a common factor, just like H of T. And the coefficients in the column matrix is four and square root of six. Now, here are two particular examples for, maybe I should use some of the masks so that the information would not be overwhelming. So here's the mask. Okay, so, and then you can select you know, different uh, functions, h of t. The simplest function is a constant function, right? It's flat, equal to one. That's the simple case. And we'll look at that case, and the more complex case is the case where you have logarithm of one plus t. Remember, t is time, okay? So, two particular case, one, the function h of t is equal to one, and the other, h of t is equal to this seemingly advanced function. And so, uh, then you need the initial uh, conditions. How many initial conditions do you expect to have in this system? So this is, in a way, a review of differential equations as well, right? So remember, you have a system of two second order equations that are coupled. Okay. Uh, the unknown are the displacement D1 and D2. And these are two second order equations. That means second order means you have second derivatives in the displacement D1 and displacement D2. So how many initial conditions do you need? Uh, four, right? Excellent. Uh, what is your name? Uh, yeah, four uh, initial conditions. So here are the two initial displacements, right? Uh, matrix D at time T equal to zero, and the coefficients D1 and D2, and the second index zero just designate that this is initial at time T equal to zero. Okay. And the numerical value is one over square root of five, 
1 and square root of 6. Again, these numerical values were obtained by design, by solving an inverse problem. So that in the end, uh, the equations, the uncoupled equations would be real simple, and you will see. Okay? And then you also have the initial velocity, right? just like uh, my student also wanted to say similar things. So derivative of this displacement, and this is in bold face, so that represents a matrix. The prime is a displacement, so velocity at time t equal to zero has two uh, components or two coefficients, v1 at time zero, the first velocity, and v2, the velocity of mass m2 at time t equal to zero, and the numerical um, values, square root of 3 over 10, 1 and minus 4 over square root of 6, again, seemingly complex, but that's by design. Okay. Has, a, has a very specific purpose there. Okay, so let's take some detail there. So now let's review. This is uh, what we derived. Right? We derived this system of two coupled uh, yeah, let me put on the mask so that the information would not be overwhelming. We derive this matrix equation, uh, called matrix equation, because all of the variables here are in bold phase, right? So these are all matrices. The mass matrix, cap M, times the acceleration matrix, that's a column matrix, D double prime. That, so that's the first term, M D double prime is the inertial force. Okay. The second term, uh, matrix C times the matrix of, of the velocity, that's the damping matrix, times the matrix of, of the velocity, that represents the damper force. Okay. Okay. Remember we have, uh, we have uh, three dampers, but two displacement between them. And then you have the stiffness matrix times the displacement matrix equal to the matrix of the applied force. And let's review what uh, the expression of these matrices. Yeah, so the displacement matrix would have the displacement D1 and D2. These are unknown functions to be found. Right? You want to solve for these displacement functions. And these are uh, these functions are time dependent. So time is the is the uh, independent variable. Okay. So this is the matrix, uh, the mass matrix M, that has the mass uh, M1 and the mass M2 on the diagonal and zero in the uh, off diagonal coefficients. So now just replace the numerical value of M1 and M2. And we, you know, the, the data of the problem says that M1 is equal to 2, M2 is equal to 1. And just replacing numbers um, yeah, yeah. we already derived this um, this expression okay. so uh, and the next thing uh, is is the uh, the damping matrix uh, so the, for the damping matrix this is the uh, result Okay. You have the damping coefficient C11, C12, C21, C22. Remember, uh, could someone remind the class and say C21? What's the meaning of the subscript 2 and 1? What's the meaning of the first subscript and what's the meaning of the second subscript? Row column. Uh, someone at the back already. So let, let me pick you. Yes. Could you stick louder? <coughs> Yeah, so first index designates the row number, second index the column number. What team number? Team one and uh, your name? Okay. Yeah, others uh, you have plenty of opportunities to contribute. But let's say uh, now you can contribute, right? Let me remind you first. So C11 is C1 plus C2. Okay, this is C11, row 1, column 1. 
that's the sum of uh, the two damping coefficients, C1 and C2. And this is just uh, plugging the numerical uh, values of C1 and the numerical value of C2, and then work out the details, and uh, come on denominator, and then you can come up with this fraction. That's not so important. Anyone can, can do this. But remember this, C1 plus C2, and you can look up in your notes, OK? What is the expression for C2? Expression for C11 is C1 plus C2. What is the expression for C2? OK. Uh, lambda? C2 plus C3, yes. Uh, and someone else, what's the expression for uh, while up here? What is the expression for C21? Okay, so here, here is important, okay, before we quit, that's minus C2. And um, so this is uh, what I explained to a student who came to see me during the special office hour. Uh, here is how you you want to remember. Let's go back to the to the uh, picture here. This this is very important. <laughs> now for the displacement, think of this for the displacement d one. It is wedge, or the mass m one is wedge wedged between c one and c two. So the coefficient c one one would be the sum of c one plus c two, corresponding to the displacement of velocity. Level of the mass M2, which is D2 prime. This mass is wedged between or in between uh, C2 and C3. So therefore, the uh, damping coefficient corresponding to the velocity uh, D2 prime would be C2 plus C3. Okay. So that's on the diagonal. Right? So say C11, C22. Now for the off diagonal coefficients, okay. You see that this uh, this damper is in between M1 and M2. So minus C2 would be the off diagonal coefficient. Okay, so that's the mental picture that you want to keep in mind. And the same thing for the um, stiffness matrix. Okay, the same thing is true for the stiffness matrix. And I think we have would have enough time. So here is just uh, let me zoom out. Here is, just, I just, here is what I just said, right? C11 is sum of C1 plus C2. C22 is sum of C2 plus C3, like Lambda said. And C12 and C21 are equal, and equal to minus, minus C2. Keep in mind the minus sign. Okay. And the Lambda is T1. Um, Okay, and you see that the same is true for the stiffness matrix. With exactly the same reasoning. You have K11 is K1 plus K2, K22 is K2 plus K3, and from the off diagonal coefficients, K12 equal to K21 equal to minus K2. Okay. The string in, in between the two masses, M1 and M2. The rest is just plugging in. Alright, so lecture summary.